It is uh, an absolute delight to be here with you this morning. And uh, Beth and I were talking on the way down here this morning. It's been 30 years since we joined Baptist Missions. And uh, we were talking about how when we came here, I don't know how many years ago it was now, but it had to have been in the 25 range that Pastor Seaman and his wife were pastoring here, took us on for support, and we've been partnering ever since. And so we counted a tremendous honor and privilege to be partnering with you. Um, our missionary career has been uh, a little bit uh, tumultuous and different than most. As many of you have known through the years and have followed us, we started out in Central African Republic, had to evacuate because of civil war. The Lord moved us to Ivory Coast where we were for about seven years. And then another uh, war came and we were torn out of that place. And then in 2006 to 2016, we served in Cameroon. And in Cameroon and in Ivory Coast, we planted churches. And in Central African Republic, where there were churches already planted, we trained leaders and uh, helped them to get into churches that needed, church, uh, needed pastors. So in 2016, uh, we got a phone call from um, the African and European Administrator for Baptist and Missions. And he asked if Beth and I would leave Africa, come back to Cleveland, Ohio, and become the administrator for Africa and Europe for Baptism and Missions as he was being uh, asked to become the president. So in 2016, Vernon Rosenau became the president. Beth and I became the administrators for Africa and Europe, and we moved from Africa back to the US. One of the most difficult transitions we've had to make. Of all of the different places we've lived and moved and been evacuated, that, that was the most difficult, leaving the African continent that we loved so much and the people there and coming back here to live in Ohio. But we knew without a shadow of a doubt that that was God's uh, will for us. And uh, so it, in some ways it was difficult, but in other ways we knew that it was to be obedient to the Lord. And so there was really no, nothing to really talk about or to discuss. And so we came back in 2016, and for the last five years, we have been serving as the administrator for Africa and Europe, of which I'll try to give you an update, a brief update on what that looks like. But before we do that, what I wanted to do was just give you a, a summary picture of the last 10 years of our ministry in Cameroon. So when we first came here, our children were very, very small. In fact, when we left for Africa in 1995, I believe uh, our children were four years old, two years old, and five months old. And so now, 30 years later, here's our family. Uh, we have, uh, we, we have uh, a boy, girl, boy, and so now our first son is married and he has two grand boys. Uh, Noah and Jasper. Our second one, daughter, is married, and she has two, uh, a little boy named Westy and a little girl named Rowan. And then we have Brandon and his fiance, Becca. They are not yet married, but uh, two of them live in Michigan, and one of them lives down in North Carolina. So we started the ministry in 2006 in, uh, in, in Cameroon, in Yaoundé, the capital city, with the goal of uh, planting a church. And so the Lord blessed, and after about five, six years, we were able to begin a building project there. And I'm just going to take you through these pictures quickly, just so that you can see what God did there uh, through, the, through the ministry of our partnership together. So what I want you to see, and as Pastor so well put it, this is a partnership. This is not just us going over there and doing all these things, and every once in a while we'll report to you and kind of give you an update. This is a partnership of working together to accomplish what only could be done if we did do a partnership. And so we have there, uh, the church building has gone up. We had a tremendously joyful uh, building dedication of which, uh, as you can see, the building was already full, even though we had just built it. However, this was a, a lot of family from other people came, and so this isn't typically how full it was all the time. But uh, this, was the, this was the big banner that we had that says, welcome to the uh, inauguration of the chapel or the church building of the Bible 
Baptist Church of Ahala, which was the name of the neighborhood in which we lived in Yaoundé, or at least the church was. God allowed us to uh, raise up and, and, and partner with a man and his wife, uh, Emile and his wife Giselle, and they are the ones who have now become the pastor of the church and are leading the church and are doing a, a tremendous job. Um, here we are five years down the road, and they are still faithfully pastoring that church, uh, growing it in different ways than, than we would have or we did. And so uh, we praise the Lord for that. So now we've been back in the States uh, for about five years, and we are serving in a different capacity altogether. Church planting is something that we did for almost uh, 25 years. And now we're doing what we call uh, member care, missionary care, um, helping with missionaries that are sent out all over Africa and Europe. That's our jurisdiction, if you will. That's where we give supervision. So this new role looks like this. We do missionary care. We do missionary retention, missionary recruitment, and missionary relations. So let me just kind of go through those one by one. Missionary care is making sure that the missionaries have the necessary care that they need. They have the necessary resources. They're cared for and actually thinking through a strategy and a plan to make sure they have what they need, make sure they get the language they need, make sure they get the training they need, the tools and the resources so that they're ready to go and when they get there, they can really thrive. Retention is also in that mix, but it also has to do with once the missionary gets to the field, they, they face a host of difficulties and challenges that we don't here in America. That may be adapting to a new culture, that is certainly trying to communicate in a completely different language. When you learn a language as I did as a child, it's natural. When you're trying to learn a language, a brand new language at the age of 25, 30, 35, 40, it's a whole nother challenge and it's a struggle. And so missionaries often get discouraged and there is a significant uh, attrition among missionaries, if you will. And so our goal and our desire is to come alongside missionaries to make sure we hear them, we pray with them, we encourage them, we listen to them, and we help them to make sure that they have all the things that they need so that they don't get so discouraged and just leave the field for numerous reasons. Missionary recruitment is also very important. As we face these days today, we find that there are more and more missionaries coming back from the U.S., or I'm sorry, back to the U.S., that are retiring. Many, many, many are retiring. Very few are actually going. For example, with our particular organization, Baptist Men Missions, there are times where we'll have, we'll have 30 people, missionaries, husbands and wives, 30 units, 30 people all together, retiring in one year. And going, new ones going to replace them, sometimes only six, sometimes 10, 11. So you can see the, the numbers are not adding up. And so we are in the process of going to churches, going to colleges, uh, trying to in inspire and encourage young people to consider Consider the, the greatest thing that you could do with your life is to share the gospel with people around the world who have never heard the good news of Jesus Christ. And missionary relations is just another way of helping us to understand that missionaries are people. Okay? Missionaries are people. They have sinful natures. They get discouraged. They fight. They disagree. And there are problems. And so sometimes I think we put missionaries on a pedestal as these super kind of human, supernatural kind of people who, you know, leave everything to go over there. Well, they're just people, folks. They're just people. And so sometimes we have to come alongside of them and work through relational issues. Sometimes it could be a husband and wife, a marriage issue. Sometimes it could be two missionaries on the same team, on the same field, 
having a philosophical issue or some kind of a pretty major disagreement that we come in, we try to help them work through that. And that's a, that's a very big part of the missionary uh, role that we play. And so um, what, what I would like to communicate to you is a heartfelt thanks for allowing us to partner with you and to continue to serve in, in this regard. And the way I, I like to think about it is this. Even though we are now based out of Cleveland, Ohio in the United States, we, we see ourselves as having a far greater impact and influence upon a much larger area, uh, many more missionaries than we did when we were in one location as a uh, single church planting missionary. So before we were working with one church plant in one city in one country. Today, we actually like to see ourselves as those who are influencing and helping and encouraging missionaries all over Europe and all over Africa with their church plants and getting new ones to go to replace those who are coming home to retire and things like that. So thank you. Thank you so much for your prayers. Thank you so much for your giving, faithful, faithful financial support all these years. We rejoice and the privilege to serve our Savior. We serve at the pleasure, right? Amen. We serve at the pleasure of our Savior, and we praise him and thank him for the opportunity that we have. So what I'd like to do now is take you to the book of uh, 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1. And uh, we will read together verses 15 through the end of the chapter. 15, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 through the end of the chapter. Second Timothy chapter 1. Uh, verse 15, this thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. Verse 16, the Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently, and he found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day, and in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus. Thou knowest very well. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the for this church and the emphasis that they put on your word. Thank you that it is a lamp unto our feet. Thank you that we can learn from it. It directs us. It, it, it guides us. It, it, is, it is so, so very vital to our ministries and to our daily lives. And so as we look into it this morning, we ask that your Holy Spirit, our teacher, would open our eyes, would, would instruct us and teach us and encourage us and inspire us and, and help us to grow as a result of looking into your word. Help us to understand what this text says to us and means to us. Help us to uh, be an encouragement and help even out of this church that you would put your hand upon, upon some person. It could be young, middle-aged, or even older. And say to that person, I'm the Lord of the harvest and, and I want you to go. I'm calling you to go. Make that known today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we have uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1. This is written by the Apostle Paul. Paul is at the end of his life. He's at the end of his ministry. He's in a, he's in a dungeon prison in Rome. And he's in a very, very volatile situation. In fact, he even says here in verse 15, This thou knowest, that all they, all they which are in Asia, be turned away from me. 
Everybody has abandoned me. They've left me alone, and here I am. Everybody. And interestingly enough, I, uh, I heard this story of a missionary that was getting ready to go to the mission field. And they decided that they were going to interview 10 different missionary families, all separate from each other. None of them knew each other. And he asked this question. He said, what is the hardest part of being a missionary? And he asked this question to singles, to couples, and to families. Now, their answer, all ten of them, without exception, was the most difficult, the hardest part about being a missionary was, in a sense, really reduced down to one word, and that was loneliness. Loneliness. Not maybe what you would think. You might think, well, the culture, the language, you know, the, all those kinds of things. But it was loneliness. And I think you would understand that Paul certainly would be in that category. He would certainly understand that. He would certainly understand what it felt to be alone, to be lonely, to not have the people that were with him. He was all alone in this jail cell. He had been abandoned by almost everybody. He was out of sight and out of mind. And honestly, some of the missionaries today, that's their greatest struggle. Someone once said that the missionary's chief occupational hazard is loneliness. Beth and I referred to missionaries as an endangered people group. Yeah, an endangered people group. If you think about the struggles, the loneliness, the hardships, the being away from friends and family, you take a missionary out of their home, out of their church, out of their small groups, out of their family, out of that whole support network, and you lift them out of there and you put them over into a strange country where they don't really know the language very well, where they don't understand the way people think, and they're trying to reach a hardened, resistant people with a language that they are still trying to learn. That's not an easy task. It's not an easy task. And here's Paul, all alone, had been abandoned. And missionaries are facing these same kind of difficulties around the world today. And Beth and I have been there. We've done that. We understand that. And so we come alongside of our missionaries to encourage them, to help them through these difficult transitions that they make. Now, verse 16, here's what Paul goes on to say. He said, The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. So this is a man, Onesiphorus, who lived in Ephesus, and probably had worked together with Paul in Ephesus, became a friend and a, and a co-worker of the Apostle Paul. And now Paul's in Rome, Paul's in prison, he's at the end of his life, he's at the end of his ministry, and many have abandoned him, have forgotten about him, oh, he's, you know, he's no longer, he can't really, really do much for us anymore, so, you know, I don't have time for him anymore, just let him end his life in peace over there in the prison, but not Onesiphorus. Onesiphorus was a man who understood what it means to come alongside of somebody and to encourage them in their weakness and in their lowliness. In fact, the word Onesiphorus actually means bringing profit or adding value. Bringing profit, adding value value. And Onesiphorus certainly lived up to his name when it came to his relationship with the Apostle Paul. Onesiphorus, interestingly enough, is only mentioned twice in the entire New Testament, both times here in 2 Timothy. Not well known, but a man who Beth and I have patterned our life and ministry in terms of missionary care after this man, Onesiphorus, and I'll give you a reason why here 
as we continue on through these verses and look at the characteristics and the qualities of this man named Onesiphorus. First thing I want you to know about this man is that he was very consistent and dependable and deliberate when it came to his care for the Apostle Paul. Notice what it says here in verse 16. It says, for he oft refreshed me. He oft refreshed me. If you're a circler, writer, highlighter, circle that little word, three-letter word, oft, often. He often refreshed me. This was very, very interesting because he was consistent at going and refreshing and finding ways to encourage and inspire the Apostle Paul often. This wasn't just a once a year card, send it off in the mail and I don't have to worry about it until next year. This wasn't just a random once in a while prayer for Onesiphorus. This was, this was a deliberate and consistent moving into the life of the Apostle Paul and encouraging him and finding ways to build him up, to add profit, to add value to his life. And that is, that is something that, as I share this with you, I want you to think of this from two angles. One, this is what Beth and I do. This is what Beth and I do to help you understand a little bit more of what the ministry looks like. But we also want you to be challenged to think about what is it as you as a church can do for your missionaries. You support more than just Stephen Beth. You support missionaries, I'm sure, all over the world. What is it that you can do to help, to be more consistent, to be more dependable, to be more ab going out of your way to continue to let your missionaries know that you're here, that you're praying for them, that you love them, that you're connected to them, that you're partnering with them. So, first and foremost, as we see that Vanessa Forrest was a consistent, dependable friend. He oft refreshed the Apostle Paul. Notice now he was a very uplifting soul. He was uplifting and edifying. It says that he oft refreshed me. Paul said, this man oftentimes refreshed my soul. The word refreshed is an interesting word. It literally means to cool again. To cool again. To cause someone to recover a state of cheer after a time of anxiety or trouble. That's what that word refreshed means. To, to cause someone to recover a state of cheer, of joy, of happiness after a time of anxiety or trouble. It could also mean to renew or to reinvigorate. And here was the Apostle Paul. Certainly need to be refreshed. Certainly need to be renewed. Certainly needed to be reinvigorated. And so he was uplifting. I don't know if you've ever heard this or not, but there are two kinds of people that walk into a room. And Onesiphorus was the latter of these two. There's one person that walks in the room and says, here I am. And then there's Onesiphorus who walks into the room and says, ah, there you are. There you are. That's the kind of person Onesiphorus was. Onesiphorus was not the kind of person that when you saw him coming, you were like, ooh, they got to go the other way. <laughs> because I know he's coming and he's just going to be all negative and he's just going to, you know, he's just going to complain about everything and he's just going to drag me down. You, you know, you know what I'm talking about. You know those people. But then there's those people that when you see them coming, you just, you just look forward to them coming into your life because you know they're going to just encourage you. You know they're going to refresh you. They're, you know they're going to build you up. You know the questions they ask you are going to make you think and inspire you. And it's just going to be a, a good, wholesome conversation. That was Onesiphorus. That was Onesiphorus. So he was consistent and dependable. He was uplifting. He refreshed. Paul, when all the others had abandoned him, Onesiphorus did not forget about Paul. 
Thirdly, he was loyal. Oh, what a great quality. What an amazing trait, if you think about it. He was loyal. And here's what I want you to see. I want you to see that at the end of verse 16, it says, He was not ashamed of my chain. He was not ashamed of the fact that I had been imprisoned for the cause of Christ. He was not thinking, well, I guess Paul really can't do much for me anymore, so you know I've got to find somebody else to follow or somebody else to be loyal to, somebody else that can help me. Not, not Onesiphorus. You know, when Paul had the, the ministry, when he was the kind of the ministry superstar and he was going around and healing people and raising people from the dead and doing all these amazing things, lots and tons of followers. But now he was in prison and he was no longer able to really do much for them and to help them and many had cast him off. They didn't have need of him anymore. But not, not on a Sephora, he wasn't ashamed. He wasn't embarrassed. He wasn't afraid of what other people might think. He continued to refresh, continued to pursue, continued to find ways to minister to this missionary, the Apostle Paul. Our missionary endeavors take us from the very beginning to the very end of a missionary lifespan. So from think of re from recruitment to retirement. So recruiting missionaries from the very beginning, bringing them through all of the training that we do, getting them to the field, helping them learn the language and adjust to the culture and visiting them on the field, strategizing with them, thinking through ministry plans and, and how we can better do this and how we can do that, all the way to retirement. And when I think of this, I, I, think of, I think of a little bit of retirement when I think of Paul nearing the end of his life now. Oftentimes, missionaries in retirement kind of get a little bit forgotten. And, and sure, they're not engaged in full-time ministry anymore. And it may be that they have planned well for their retirement so churches can back off on the support and begin to support other new ones, which is really what we desire and what we put into practice in our mission so that they save throughout the years, they stay into Social Security, they, they put away monies for retirement so that when the time comes, they can say, God has provided, please use your funds to take on some newbies to replace us. But when they get to that point, they still... They still need encouragement. These are veteran missionaries who have dedicated their whole life to serving overseas. And now they're back. They're back in a country that, quite frankly, really isn't even their own. They feel out of place. They feel strange. They, they, have lost, they don't have relationships like you folks do. You have grown up here. You have family. You have lifetime friends. I was talking to my neighbor yesterday, and he was getting ready to go out and go golfing with some buddies of his that he has known since high school. And I thought to myself as a missionary kid myself and as a missionary who has been back and forth across the ocean so many times I've, I can't remember, I don't have friends from high school. I don't have friends from college. I, I don't even have friends. We, we, we have a hard time understanding what, what a real long-term long friendship is these days as missionaries. And so here we have those retired missionaries. They come home and they need constant encouragement. They need to be reminded that God is faithful even as they enter into these difficult years, trying to adjust to life without the, the, the service that they had when they were living overseas. So he was not ashamed and would continue to seek out and help Paul even when in his difficult times, even at the end of his life. One of the other things I want you to notice from this text is that Paul was, ex or not Paul, Onesiphorus was exceedingly intentional in his actions. I don't know about you, but the older I get, the more I realize that it, having good intentions is one thing, and being intentional is a whole nother thing. Being intentional about about making phone calls, being intentional about going on visits, being intentional, intentional about things 
is, is very rare today. In fact, we found that people will say, oh, yeah, yeah, we should get together. Yeah, we, 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 it was a great time today. We'll, we'll call you. We'll get together. And days, weeks, even months go by, not a word. Not Onesiphorus. Onesiphorus was very intentional. In fact, look at verse 17. But when he was in Rome, this is Paul again writing, he said, when Onesiphorus was in Rome, he came from Ephesus to Rome, he sought me out very, very diligently and he found me. He found me. Now, here's what you got to remember. Uh, Ephesus to Rome was probably about a thousand mile journey. It probably took anywhere from three to four weeks of travel for Onesiphorus to get to Rome. When he got to Rome, day after day, with grim determination, Onesiphorus roamed the streets of this massive city, going from dungeon to dungeon, to Cartier to, Cartier is a French word, from neighborhood to neighborhood, from suburb to suburb, looking for Paul. Very deliberate, very incarnational. How does it matter how long it took, how tiring and, and, and fatigued he was, how much money he had to spend? He was exceedingly intentional and incarnational, seeking out the Apostle Paul to add value to him, to bring profit to him. He was motivated by love. He was motivated by love for this man whom everyone else had abandoned. He was intentional. Beth and I strive to be that. We fail. We're certainly not perfect. But we strive to be intentional at reaching out to our missionaries, at reaching out to our churches, at thanking you for your support and your prayers. And I, I just want to encourage you as a church. I want to encourage you as a church, the missionaries that you support, be very intentional about showing ways to show them your love for them, your care for them, that, that, that you haven't forgotten about them, that you know them by name, and that you pray for them, and you know their kids, you know what struggles they have if they share with you in, in prayer letters, and that you remind them that you truly do care for them. That's what they need. Last but not least, in verse 18, says the Lord grant unto him, unto Onesiphorus, that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. Last but not least, he was a, he, he was a faithful servant. He was a faithful servant. Onesiphorus was faithful. He wasn't a flash in the pan. He wasn't a one-time show up and, and uh, you know, be a big star and then leave and never be a part of the ministry again. No, he was a faithful servant. He rendered service. He understood the mantra and the truth that life is for service. He understood very well what Jesus said. I did not come to be ministered to. I did not come to be served. I came to serve, to give my life as a ransom, to give my life, to pour out my life for other people. That's what Vanessa Forrest did. That's what he understood, and he put that into practice. So that is a, a, a way for you to help, help you understand our compelling heart and ministry and what we do now and how we have kind of patterned a little bit after Onesiphorus and his ministry, his heart, but also to encourage you as a church to be that, to be that Onesiphorus to your missionaries and to your people. In fact, I coined a new word. It hasn't made it on Google yet. It hasn't been, you know, in, into the dictionary yet, but someday it might be there. I, I'm, I want to challenge you. I want to leave you with this one challenge. I want to challenge you to onesophorize your missionaries. Onesophorize your missionaries. Add value to them. Bring profit to them. Encourage them. Show them 
that you care for them. Go out of your way. Spend a little extra time, a little extra money, a little extra brain thought of what you could do to add value to your missionaries as Beth and I strive to do each and every day for the missionaries that we serve all over Africa and all over Europe. So we have 12 nations in Europe. And we have right now we have actually 10 nations in Africa where we serve. I just came back two and a half maybe weeks ago from Ghana where I had gone to do a, a sit down strategic plan with a Bible college and the missionaries over there. And even though I had to have three COVID tests, thankfully all three came back negative. And uh, I was able to, to go and to be a part of that strategic planning. And, and those are just the kind of things that even though it's not fun to travel these days, it's difficult, it's a little bit more risky than normal, uh, God makes a way. And we, we, we serve because that's what life is for. Life is for service. So I inspire you and encourage you this morning to serve. Serve each other. Serve your church. Serve your missionaries and, and add value to each other. Even as church members, add value to each other. Bring profit to one another. And walk into the room and say, ah, there you are. How can I serve you? How can I pray for you? Let's do this together. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you again for your word. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the joy that we have to partner with them. Thank you so very much, Lord, for the opportunities that you've given to us as your servants, as your children, to be the light and the salt in this world. Lord, we, we count it an honor to be your ambassadors, to be your representatives everywhere we go, and specifically the places that you've called us to go as missionaries, as lay people, as pastors. Lord, we are so grateful for that. We pray that you would use us today to take these truths that we've just learned from Onesiphorus Forrest and 2 Timothy and make sure that we actually apply them to our lives, put them into practice, do something about what we've heard this morning so that we won't just be hearers, but we'll be doers of your word. In Jesus' name. Onesiphorize. I like it. Now, how simple can that process be? I'm telling you, very simple. Because last Sunday, I walked out the back door and I thought, the sidewalk is very colorful these days. Now, I am not, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm not expressing what maybe the parents thought of their children doing this. But I... Pastor, and I brought Pastor Corey and Abby out there. I said, look at this. Somebody had wrote nice things about many people in this church. And they didn't see, you don't see it because it's on that side of the sidewalk. And I encouraged them. And then I found out mom and dad may not want them to do this ministry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would love it down this sidewalk. I would really love it down this sidewalk because... It is just some words with chalk on a sidewalk. But I'm telling you, it spoke volumes. Mr. Jones, everybody remember Harold Jones? At the most proper time, I would get a letter from him in the mail. And it was always encouraging. And I cannot tell you, there are times, you think, now Pastor Grover, we pay you to spend time with God. I got it. But that's not all that happens here. And so to receive those letters is very important. And I encourage you, if you think that is what the Lord is calling you to do, to um, encourage people, and you need some additional resources, I would love to see that as a min somebody's ministry. We sent the birthday cards. I know Kathy did a great job on that. And if you continue that, but please encourage them. It is always helpful and needful to come alongside of them and let them know that they are valued. So, so glad to have JT with us this morning. <laughs> and that's John T. Man. He is heading up our release time. Was there anything you wanted to share with the people, John, while you're here? I didn't want to put you on the spot, but I didn't want to. So, so glad for John and his work. 
Um, now, how long can you stay, Steve? I know you have to run. I'm here. I, I just have to be back this afternoon sometime. Okay. So make sure you come and uh, meet, greet Steve and Beth. I, I, I know you were here recently, but I can't remember when that was. It doesn't matter. They send these updates. We know what's going on with the Galt, and we praise the Lord to be able to participate with them. And the nice feed. Did you notice the verse he had at the bottom of the slide? Job. And he has set up this evening's message par excellent. <laughs> and so come back this evening, and we're going to tie in Paul, the master administrator. We think of him as the master evangelist, but he was a great administrator, and we'll see why this evening. That's all, Stan. Thank you for being here. Look forward to uh, this evening. Get to know or regreet our missionaries, and let's close with the word of prayer. Lord, we are so grateful for Jesus Christ. And Lord, you sent us a comforter. So why would we not want to be a comfort to someone else? So Lord, I pray that as we understand the work of the Holy Spirit, which is immense, and I'm not saying we're the equivalent, but you knew enough when you departed that we would need to be comforted. Lord, we ought to understand that when people leave their culture, their friends, their family to go somewhere else, we need to be that comfort to them as well. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to use this church to serve the missionaries abroad. And Lord, we have a grand field open for us today. And I pray we would walk through it as well.